find the origins of the wool industry in West Yorkshire, and indeed the world, you need to come to this part of West Yorkshire, Saltair Bradford. This is where it all started. Um, the manufacturing of wool began in the beginning of the uh, 19th century uh, in these valleys. The water was soft. The wool came from Australia via the canal systems from Liverpool. Mills prospered around this area, making worsted suitings and women's wear materials for the clothing manufacturers in Leeds, 14 miles away down the river. This mill, what we're in at the moment, opened in 1853, and I think in the old days would produce around 20 million meters of fabric a year. That was replicated throughout this region, and then it went to Italy, then it went to Turkey, then it went to China, uh, but the beginnings are here. First wool from Australia came back here in 1807, and in a way competed with local wools. Now, local wools from the hills of West Yorkshire, and the hills of the Lake District, not terribly far away from here, were obviously used in carpets and heavy-duty fabrics. By heavy-duty, I mean overcoats, military fabrics, and of course, we now have a big production in this country of tweed, and tweed is often made out of a Cheviot uh, sheep wool, which, uh, of which there are millions in this part of the world. The Australian merino and the South African merino to, um, were typical uh, fab fibers used in mills in West Yorkshire for suitings, uniforms, and ladies' fabrics. Um, it's a finer micron uh, wool from the merino, which originated from Spain and was taken out to Australia uh, at the end of the 18th century by a gentleman called uh, John MacArthur and his wife Elizabeth, who cultivated the merino flocks in Parramatta in New South Wales. Sadly, at the end of the Korean War in 1953, we saw a rapid decline of worsted manufacturing in this area. That is linked intimately to the development of man-made fibers, particularly acrylic fibers and polyester fibers in Europe and in the emerging economies of East Asia. They competed purely on price, and mills in this area closed down one by one until the Rot stopped, if I can say that, around the late part of the 20th century. There were several mills in this area who were fine and niche. They were aiming their production at a rather refined taste level in knitwear and in suitings and jacketings. And that British look, that British style, exported itself very well to the emerging economies of Asia. And particularly, we start with Japan, in the 1960s when the Japanese market opened up, we followed by Korea in the 1980s, and followed by China in the 1990s. So you have three powerful economies that are enjoying good quality fabrics, good quality tailoring, good quality manufacturing, and above all, luxury brands. And British fabrics in this part of the world, in the finer micron category, and also in the tweed category, were there to service those brands which were often licensed in Japan and Korea. Casualization hit the industry about 10 years ago, um, and the spinners and weavers of worsted yarn in particular uh, have been rather clever in adapting a feel, a touch, that makes a nexus skin garment in merino, fine merino, uh, under 16 micron, the most amazing garment one can wear. It's got odor control, it's got, it's got climate control, it keeps you warm, when it's cold and cool, when it's hot. It's a natural choice. Uh, wool is not cheap and never has been. Uh, to produce a wool next to skin garment is an expensive item. Uh, a cotton, a polyester one is not. What we have been successful in doing is developing the right fabrics, the right yarns and fabrics for next to skin, for active sportswear, for what we call athleisure. Uh, but we haven't been able to really compete with cotton and polyester on price. And I don't think we want to. What we need to do is to explain to the consumer the ecological and environmental advantages of investing a bit more in wool. Firstly, for comfort next to skin. Secondly, for the biodegradable environmental advantages of having a natural fiber uh, as part of your sporting kit. The current pandemic that has hit all the major economies is having a massive effect on production in this part of the world. The mills in this area of West Yorkshire and in Scotland and in the west of England should normally be producing their fabrics by the kilometre for the autumn winter season 2020-21. Uh, that production slowed down dramatically. 
with reports of mills losing 50 to 70 percent of production. Um, the big acid test for the industry will be the performance at retail, both brick and mortar and online in the autumn of this year in the Northern Hemisphere. We're waiting to see what happens. I have two ideas. One, casualization will continue and we need to capitalize on the message of environmental sustainability of wool in that, in that sector of the market. The other area we've got to discuss is that there will be a, some revenge buying of formal wear. There will be some revenge buying of smart suits, smart jackets, smart trousers, etc. Uh, but that will be, in my view, quite niche. And this sort of market trend very much favors made to measure. A lot of companies that were normally known for their uh, ready to wear are working very, very cleverly with made to measure. Uh, price is very often not dissimilar to the ready to wear prices. Uh, the words reset, rethink, rejig, remodel have been used very much in discussions about the world of fashion and the world of interiors and living post COVID. I think the Prince of Wales' message for a global reset is timely. It's not a new message. The Prince of Wales has been saying that for the last 30 to 40 years. We hope that any reset or any rethinking about fashion and about what I would say the evils of fast fashion uh, will include a, th a manner of thinking about the ecology and the environment and to understand that wool is an amazing fiber that actually biodegrades, enriches the soil, um, is good next to skin. It has all the attributes of something which is of great value not only to the consumer but of great value to the environment.